Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Yeah, we've just interrupted that uh, front row death chart to bring you some better stuff live uh, with Ronald Agar and Brian Driscoll in the studio. That's how are you doing? Hey, John. Great. Um, I don't know if I should start with this or not, but this is a very uh, important anniversary in your life, Brian. It's 12 years to the day since the Battle of Bayonne. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I'm sure you celebrate it every year. I've, I look at it in the mirror every day and I can see the marks from it. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the video again. I hadn't seen that in years. What a sucker punch. Filthy cheap shot. Jesus I was, trying to, I was trying to be peacemaker and the next thing... Bang, out of nowhere. He's also massive. Yeah. Quinny, Quinny comes up to him eventually. Him coming, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Quinny comes up to him eventually and kind of pushes him away and is like, actually, you know what, you're, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hold you back there. It was uh, not a what happy... move, wasn't it? That, the the Bayon game, Ireland yeah, Bayon. Yeah, but oh, oh, there was a fight and it was actually... Um, was it? A New Zealander. No, it was a Kiwi guy. Yeah. And it was... Um, What's the name of the English referees? First, Wayne Barnes. Wayne Barnes. 27-year-old Wayne Barnes. His first games, and I remember saying to him at one point, Wayne, if you don't get control of this, I'm going to take the players off the pitch. This is getting, this is getting wild. Yeah, it was. Um, there was like filthy stuff going on in Rooks. And, uh, and then that happened, and I remember walking off going, See? See? <laughs> <laughs> My point. A nasty undercurrent for the whole game. Oh. Remember your brewing. man, Richard Dort, he was, the centre? Uh, yeah. Oh, jeez, he was, there was a dig thrown at every rook from him. It was, obviously, the Bay Ritz and Bayon and very passionate people, but they went completely over the... And what, like, what, what, what kicked it off? Why did they care so much? Because it was Ireland that was a chance to lay down a marker. Yeah, I think so. A national team coming, and that was their massive excitement, and there's the Fete de Bayon and all this, and the, yeah, it was... Um, you could even, f uh, before the game there wasn't that much tension, but uh, during the game you could feel that this thing was going over spill and that's what French teams do at home. Because you were killing them at that stage with like 40 points already. Lay down a mark. Sure, there true. was nothing in it for them at that yeah. stage, so win lose the match, win the fight. Mikaira Tehuata was his name. Yeah, I got a call from him, an apologetic. Sorry about that, pal, I thought, you know, you were starting on one of my players. No, I wasn't. Wow. Yeah. A couple of days later? Or a couple of years later? No. Two days later, yeah. Right, okay. And when you get that call, are you thinking, screw you, buddy? I'm just thinking I'm very frustrated because I don't know what's happening. I've, you know, I'm going to miss some more warm-up games. I think at that stage, I probably know I'm not going to win, miss the World Cup. To be fair, you didn't get 21 and curl, <laughs> curl into a ball and lay on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got over it, pal. What do you mean? <laughs> when I <laughs> on the 2001 Lions tour, when I got the head punched off me, I just lay there frozen. <laughs> Duncan McCrazy. Oof, yeah. But yeah. There's the pointing was as good as any digs back though, Raj, right? Yeah. There's your, um, the pointing was great, it was world class pointing. In point. fairness to, uh, to my cousin Gary who stitched me afterwards, he did a, a phenomenal job, that's Ooh, him there. That's a lot of pressure, your cousin stitching you, at least if it was like random or stitching, he's like, I'm never going to see you again, but you know, there's like a... Really, weir really weirdly, right? Um, um, Quite happy with that haircut, I reckon. I, I got a matching one on the, on the other side in, our, in the game that we should have, you know, down in Christchurch and um, that we should have we should have won. Dan's wonky drop goal. Yeah. I got one exactly from, from Dunnick Ryan, I think it was, need me in the face. <laughs> And I got a literally really perfect one, so it just looks like creases in my face now. So, thanks. As age has turned them into wrinkles. Right. We're also <clears throat> we also appear to wearing a, be wearing a blue jersey, a blue Irish jersey. Was it or is it just bad grainy YouTube footage? That was, no, yeah, no, that, that was, was yeah. the um, the third jersey at the time. Right. So there was a bit of excitement about wearing that. I think so. That was a night kit, wasn't it? No. 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 It was, was that was two Puma. Three was it? Was it Puma? Canterbury, apparently JP is saying Canterbury. Canterbury. Uh, look, <laughs> got it all right. <laughs> Adidas. Oh, <no. laughs> Let's name it for everybody else. Yeah, you're both Adidas, aren't you? Yes. Yes. We yeah. Are. You, lo you love your Adidas. Let's get that out there. There are other brands, but these two especially <laughs> love their Adidas. <laughs> Uh, so that's August before the World Cup. Um, at that stage, of that World Cup was it too late? Everything had already gone tits up for you, or do you think that could have been rescued? At that stage. Yeah. No, it was. Nowhere near the drama to come at that stage. That was only the start of it. But um, yeah, the warm-ups hadn't gone well. I think we'd scraped home against Italy and Raven Hill, had we? Yeah. That was coming later. I missed that one because of that. Oh, okay. But I remembered that being the start of the panic, thinking we oh. are 
so far off here. We that we're game, still forty points up, were we? In what? In, in the this game, game, yeah. In that game, yeah, but it's, oh, okay. but you, it was you know, it was a club side. That, yeah, well, you know, but you were, it wasn't as though we had to do a huge amount to to do that. You know, we were a national team against against that. Bayon, but um, but I remember in in the Italian game when you you hit a, another wonky drop goals, or, or was that a good strike? No, it was a good try. It's a try. Oh, jeez! Mm -hmm. One Excuse of my sixteen. Sixteen? <laughs> no, just you get did that in. Not. Sixteen did you test score tries. Sixteen. I'm just shows if you get a second touch as a ten, exactly. you can get that score. There I you am. Didn't Look, power too many over. There's no. Here. There's no many. <laughs> I still make the first page. <laughs> of all time try no scores. Way. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's one of those things that keep you going under the radar. Um, but I remember being in the dressing room afterwards and Eddie talking and just thinking. We want to get our act together quickly here. There was some doubt about that game even happening, and it kind of gets announced to you guys late on in the whole thing. What, did anybody think to say, why are we playing this bunch of French people who are going to try and kill us? I think you can't really very, do that, can you? Very different when you're the player and the mindset. You know what I mean? That's most definitely probably a decision for management. I don't think. And you all felt that was okay. Like you need the games at the time. Well, well, what are you going to say? No, we're not going to play it. No, you know? well, like what? There's no, there's no win. Stick out the B team that you had down in. Uh, Jimmy games. We only. I think we, we didn't have a lot of warm up games. That's obviously why that one was put in. Right. Because we couldn't get other internationals, so we had to make do with with um, with a club game. So, yeah, it was pretty imperfect. So that's why some of us did need to to. Get some minutes. So you feel it's starting to go at that point, and then the warm-ups aren't great. So I was looking back and doing a bit of reading about that. Uh, there's a sense um, that the warm-ups hadn't gone well. I didn't never think that the warm-ups mattered, but apparently they do. Like it, in terms of finding form and. Well, I think the warm-ups don't matter if you blast your first game, but our first game was Georgia, wasn't it? Georgia and Namibia. Yeah. Which? Then, yeah. The referee robbed Georgia of victory. So like, you know what I mean, if your warm-ups aren't going well, but then you kind of, all of a sudden, manage to do a great job in Georgia, everything is gone, you're grand, you have momentum, but like, if your warm-ups haven't gone well, and you absolutely struggle against Georgia, it is massive panic stations, because you have to be realistic. But the other side of that too, Jared, I, I wouldn't say it was for lack of caring, I think there was a great atmosphere in the camp. I remember that well. It was a very tight knit group. It was very um, players who really cared. And I think, it, for me, my takings from that would be that we, I think, we overtrained Monday to Friday, and there wasn't juice less for Saturday when we needed to. In the tournament itself. Yes. Even at the tournament, you could have rescued it by like calming things down. Well, I, uh, if I had another shot, that's probably what I would have done. Now that I'm into coaching, you know. Yeah. But it, it, there was an example we tried to defend Argentinian plays the week of the, of the Argentinian game and in practice they did an 8-9-14 and we couldn't defend it. We defended it again, we couldn't defend it and we were like, what is going on? You know, so it was just, if you can't get it right in training. They, did they score from it as well? Yeah. In the game? You know, yeah. so, like, <laughs> how did that happen? It's a hard one to kind of... So when in training, when it's, so th there's a move that you're saying this is Argentina and so who's actually doing it? Like, the, is it the second eight, ten, fourteen who are doing it? And they're ripping the first choice Irish defence part? Yeah, that's what happened during that week, yeah. Right, that's not good for morale, is it? Yeah, but like, there's a point that you have to just leave something as well, where it, it you know, repetitively happens, and you're, you, you feel as though people know what they're going to do and how they're going to defend it. And you've got to be leave, fine it, when leave it to them. Yeah, in. exactly. And you know what would be fine, and we'll have a bigger scrum, and you know we'll put pressure on the number eight, and the knock-on effect of all of that will be positive. But they still managed to score from what I remember thinking, geez. Right. Because just to put a bit of context on this for anybody, the 2006 season was a brilliant season, like right in the hunt for a championship until the last couple of seconds beat Australia in um, Lansdowne Road in like a completely control that game against some terrible conditions but actually play really good rugby and that's that team that has all that expectation heading into the World Cup in 2007 it's been like an 18 month roll of good stuff and yeah I agree Jory you're right yeah, yeah we beat like, South Africa in that November as well didn't we uh, we played in those in those like we, I genuinely thought we had a good chance of, of winning the competition you know and that was <clears> probably a very un-Irish thing to do at the time but 
we, we had brilliant training camps in Poland. Everyone kind of off the pitch in terms of athletic wise was hitting PBs in the gym and on the skills we were going really well. Um, but we just didn't transfer, you know. Is this a is this a, a is this a thing with Ireland and World Cups where we haven't got the cycle right, where we peak a little bit far out? Because it feels like we peaked this time last year over the six to eight months before that, and it doesn't feel like Ireland are at their peak at the moment. It doesn't feel like we're obviously there's there's plenty of time to solve things now, but um, well, in 07, confidence wasn't could never have been higher. You know, we were we didn't win the slam we didn't win the Six Nations but we should, should have won the Six Nations other than a refereeing decision in another game um, which, which a questionable TMO job from, a, from an Irish TMO I remember well and, and we, so we, and we shouldn't have, should have beaten France so our confidence was super high in advance of those warm up games so we were in a great spot then yeah. but we, it just unravelled very quickly for us um, I think you can look on, on the current crop in a couple of different ways. And you have to play the hand that's dealt to you and the situation you find yourself in. If Ireland had won the, won the Six Nations or won the Slam, they'd be on a crest of a wave, but there would also be enormous pressure on them. Um, and there's good and bad that comes with that. I think now the expectation from the country in particular is, has dropped enormously. An, an Irish amount? Oh, an, an incredible amount. Uh, and we don't do middle ground. It's no. it's really top of the tree or bottom it's of the barrel. Yeah. yeah, and so as a result, the pressure definitely has come off from a public expectation point of view. But I don't think it's changed dramatically from a player perspective. They feel they're not going into it to try and get to a semi final. They're definitely going to try and win it, and they can win it, but they need a lot to go right for them. It's it, it's just a coincidence that this has happened again. That our team has come off its high. Five, six months out, it's not something that we're doing wrong as a rugby yeah. culture or anything, is it? I think it's a great question. I, I honestly can't answer that y yet, Jar, obviously, because it'll be how it pans out in terms of whether you get it right. I think the advantage someone like New Zealand has is that uh, when push comes to solve deep down, they're proven winners, and I think they can, they can um, lean on that. I think you look at it in the previous two World Cups, the, n New Zealand never won the rugby championship, I think, and they went on to win a World Cup in 11 and 15. And I hadn't realised that actually. Uh, well, sorry, I. That's right. I read that. I don't know. No, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, so I. Th but I think definitely. Um, those New Zealand teams are better than the current New Zealand team, without a shadow of a doubt, or, uh, as well. But in terms of getting. Um, Answering your question, I think it's so much if it comes to mindset in terms of the mental side of the game, how, how well when the real pressure comes on will the current crop, but they are far more experienced and far more mature and further down the line in, in their development than previous Irish sides were and their, I think, capacity to not look on the past is a strong point of their game and they have a New Zealand coach who treats New Zealand for what they should be treated like, while in previous campaigns they were probably New Zealand and the rest of the world and then Ireland. I, I think a really important aspect is that in every other World Cup before this one that we had beaten almost every team but not every team. And we have beaten every Tier 1 team in the last two years that's, been, that's come across us. So what that does for your mentality going into a tournament is that you don't have to do something that no other yeah. Irish side has done before. And I think that definitely throws the shackles off a little bit and just, and you're able to not, you know, you're not looking to finals, you're just, you're very much living in the moment, win the group, and then you've got the quarterfinal of all quarterfinals. And it's just a game, with the <coughs> it's just a game at that stage, it's not like we, we have to make, okay, so they do have to make history in getting past the quarterfinal, but it's not making history because you'll have beaten South Africa or New Zealand, whoever it is, mm. in that game. Um, just to talk briefly about who you think it's going to be, at the moment, uh, New Zealand are still seven point favourites for the game against the Springboks at this stage out. That seems a little bit generous. I would say it's much closer to a 50-50 game at this point, given how well South Africa have improved in the last 18 months. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you, I think. I expected them, obviously, to be a lot better, but maybe I didn't expect to make up as the vast amount of strides they have made, and their game seems very suited to Cup Rugby. I think um, 
whichever nine they play with. Obviously, um, Faf playing at nine, I think he's has an excellent kicking game, but he also has a good a attack threat. They're a far more balanced team, but I think also the fact that they have an awful lot more strength and depth. You, you consider back South Africa 12 months ago, like mm. this, it's incomparable what's turning out now. And even see them against Argentina last weekend with um, Francois Steyn. He looks fit, he looks hungry, he looked really impressive. Sometimes you just look watch him from Montpellier and you just, is it the same player? And I think, speaking to players of played for Munster under uh, Jacques Niembar and Razi Erasmus, I think um, Niembar is meant to be a really, really good coach. And um, it's hard to play against the, the kind of defence structure he has set up. Um, what, what is the defence structure? How does that work? I actually don't know too much, Ger, because I haven't <coughs> played or, or spent time in his company, but it seems to me that it's a very much a, a push-up at all costs. And that can get exposed, but you need to have really good skills, but I think there'll be a hard surface and probably dry ball in Japan, so that will probably favour the skills of Australia and New Zealand, because rugby is completely yeah. different when it's a wet day as well. It's a completely, like soccer is pretty similar, but... They were swinging a lot against New Zealand a couple of weeks ago, and you know, if you get a good kick, you know, pass kick game or kick pass game, um, you can leave your fullback very exposed in that environment. If it comes off, it looks phenomenal, but you do you run the gauntlet a small bit by pl you know, playing as aggressively like that. You've got to leave somewhere open. So it's just a matter of Moanga or, or Bowden Barrett or whoever's playing at 10 to identify and see that space quickly. And, and sometimes it's about drawing that defence on you, even getting it into second receiver's hands or you know, dummy switch and cross kick to pull, manipulate the defence, pull it up and then you know, still go ahead with your plays. And um, The point of that is to, to try and create an opening at that point or is it to try and condition them to have a second thought well, when they're I trying to push a bit forward? Of both. I think you, you know, early on in the game when a, a team is trying to fly off the line, what do you try and do? You, know, you call a five-man line out. Um, and you know that it's going to be man on, and you try and dink one over, um, just to keep them honest, to 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 make them realise that you know we're we're going to have variety to our game today. We're not going to try and always run through you. So yeah. remember, next time we do a five man, that this is a viable option. So you know, I, I think there's you have to be clever that way, and and there's many ways of trying to slow a defence down and and manipulate it, and it's by bringing different options to them. Um, and just second guess them a little bit. If you uh, had to make a virtual bet now, who would you think the winners of our group will end up playing? Will it be South Africa or New Zealand? Who's going to play South Africa? Right. I think New Zealand will get it together, and you know they're they're not panickers. As Rod said, they've they've earned the right to be calm in situations of stress because of what they've done the last eight years. So um, I think they'll they'll get it back together, and in a big game like that, they'll they'll you know it'll be brutal but it'll be um, I think they'll just get the job done and that's why I fancy us against South Africa you know provided we win our, our our four games as well let's not jump the gun just yet you know we still yes you're not winning any World Cup you're not winning all those games but you got to still show a bit of respect to both uh, well to, to to Scotland and to Japan everyone's talking up you know the the, the Japanese team as well they'll they'll throw some plays at us Who's going to be the starting at half for the All Blacks in the World Cup? Do you think? We're just talking about it outside. I I don't know. I think, like, is he getting stubborn now, Hanson? You know, continuing with he's a pretty stubborn Moanga. character, isn't he? I you know I think it's if he's not planning on going with Moanga, I think it's crazy that he's playing him this weekend um, because they need to get the confidence, and that's why I feel that this is the combination that he's thinking about uh, going with. You know that two distributors. Um, I think they're. You know, Damien McKenzie just shows um, what a big loss. I feel that he is, even though he's you know small in frame. What he can do as a first receiver when the ball gets to the middle of the field, he can cause real danger, and and he can manipulate defenses. What he does, and, and I just feel as though they want to get that really good second playmaker. And as good a player as Ben Smith playing at fullback, I don't think he does that as well as Moanga and and Bowden Barrett can do it. Who do you think is going to be? I don't know. I genuinely, I, I, I think he wants to see um, Luanga's capacity to uh, play Saturday after Saturday after Saturday. Can he do that against the Tier One teams? 
and then I think he's going to have a look. But I, I think he always knows he has Bowden Barrett to fall back on. I think he's looking to see uh, what's next or can Richie do what he does for the Crusaders at test level. Th that's, that's my God on it, I think. I'd worry for what New Zealand are, are doing in the centre at the moment. Yeah. Like, I think that's the huge, the back row, obviously, when you lose Jerome Kaino and, and Richie McCall, um, you, they, and they've replaced them with players that are just not of that calibre. But for me, an even bigger um, void has been Nam Mananu and Conrad Smith. And I'm not unimpressed with Leonard Brown, but I, I think he's all right. He, he hasn't done anything magnificent at international level. Crotty's, Roger know a little bit better about him. You know, very solid player, doesn't make a lot of errors, but I, I don't know where their where their real cleverness and you know and X factor is coming from. Yeah, I don't think they I don't think they have an X factor centre bar Sonny Bill, but Sonny Bill he's is the off. eighty minutes is the impact. But he's been off the boil as well, yeah. you know. Um but I, I actually think the glue of the team or, or the brands of the teams is Crotty, but he needs he needs shape and the system around him going really well for him to be at his optimum. But he is a fantastic brain about the game, uh, really deep thinker, but sometimes may overanalyze it. But when he gets it right, I think he's he is um, world class. And good, Hugh? Uh, massive work rate, honest. Um, does the simple things well. Uh, Big unit too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, massive unit. Yeah. Um, f physically uh, very fit, but still young in his, in his international days, mm. you know. He's not, wouldn't have an outside break. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know I me mean, really puts value on getting second and third touches, mm. uh, playing on the short side, just left-footed option. Uh, very keen to learn, but would would still admit that he's not the finished article himself. A starter? Yeah, I think he's the thirteen. Yeah, he is. I think he's there. Uh, people might know too much over here, but the the, the fastest guy they have is uh, Braid Neener. But he hasn't featured at all. But right. uh, I thought he was a certainty for the bench. But no, he's not going. I don't think he's going to be playing on the bench if he hasn't featured in the last three games. I th I, I Having been down there, how confident are you that it's going to be a New Zealand team that wins the World Cup? Because obviously that's what they expect. I, I, I think it's. Uh, I think no. I don't think down there they expect. I think they're realistic of where they are. Right. But um, they obviously won't like it if they if they don't do it. But um, are they realistic to where they are though? Is it not like oh, we're not as good as how we were? We were so much better than the rest of the world in, in the last. World Cup in particular, that are, uh, you know, 10% off that is still enough to get it done? No, I think there would be the old school that would probably be uh, stoic or stern, uh, New Zealand at all costs, but there's another uh, uh, dawn and realisation that uh, the game can be played in different ways and uh, Cup rugby, I think when the Lions went down there in, uh, how many years ago was that? Two. Two, two in terms of you know, I mean, they've turned defence on its head, and for them to concede 47 points in a test match, it's. I tell you, not having a, a goal kicker them. up in the 80 percent and percentile as well is. <coughs> I tell you, when it's ordinarily they would never have worried about that because they've just been try scorers, but they've averaged 17 or 18 points in this rugby championship. You know, 20 less than last year, so they're not scoring like they were, so their attack is struggling a little bit, and they're not keeping the scoreboard ticking over as well. So, you know, it's very un-New Zealand-like to have to resort to that. They had Dan Carter for a number of years, and he did that anyway. Yeah, but they probably that took that for granted. Not, yeah, that, now that that's not happening, you know, you know, could, could you miss out? They've, they've lost test matches on the back of, of missed goal kicks from Bowden Barrett, undoubtedly. Let's talk about Ireland and, and what the makeup of the squad is going to be. Um, when Cooney got cut, that was kind of an indication about what the makeup of the rest of the, the players were going to go. Uh, or, or was it, I mean, at the moment, is Joey Carberry the de facto third choice scrum half as well as the second choice out half? Gee, I don't know. No, thanks. Um, uh, Joey Carberry is 
for me, seems to be the second choice anywhere, bar nine. Like, I think his footballing ability, he, he'll, he'll play in every game. That doesn't mean he'll start, but I think he'll have a, he'll have a role to play in the Russia Samoa games and also in the big games because he has something that a uh, few of the people in the green jersey have. He has that capacity to win a game on his own. I think he's that good a, a footballer in broken play that you can throw him in anywhere. Um, he's the sort of guy that if you got to a final, you'd find he was pl he played some some for, some part in all seven games. You can, yeah, it's uh, you can see that his early years were probably spent in New Zealand, where there was such an emphasis on skills. You know, I think that's what's interesting for people over this side. It's only when you go down there you kind of understand that it's all out attack. They don't have a, any appreciation for kind of the cup rugby. In terms of what Brian's point is right about the goal, they, they wouldn't have had a drop goal policy for previous World Cups, which would seem strange to a lot of people, but they would be convinced that, no, we have a shape and a policy and a philosophy to play rugby that will present that opportunity if we, if we do this right and that right. But sometimes you need you know what I mean, a tic-tac or a zigzag, something like that, where you just get someone in the pocket that that needs to be there. But New Zealand's philosophy is different, but I think now um, there are genuine question marks even from um, within some of the players because rugby is way more accessible and watching the European Cup, we watched the Saracens-Leinster game when we were down there and people are aware of the trends <coughs> and the difference in kind of uh, in mentality and putting huge value on your defence what they build their team and putting huge value on attack so it, 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 it is different and super rugby is open it's wild you score, we score have the ball, have a go while over this side of the world you set up that you don't really give them any space but what happens and what they've done I think what they're learning from is that New Zealand realise now that in the past up to uh, probably even that game in Ireland when Cruden hit that conversion to in 13 I think there was probably up to then they didn't care if Ireland scored first they wouldn't be worried if Ireland went 9 nil up but now they realise, I don't think we can get that back if we give teams a start. So they're putting an emphasis on that, but it's not their natural game. But they realise that, I suppose, with so fellas like coaches like Joe Schmidt, he's so smart and that he gives away, or his team give away less than, you know, five penalties on a day. How do you get into the game against Ireland? If they don't give you the ball. Well, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And this is a, <coughs> Ireland maybe not that we saw against England or not that we saw against Wales, but up to that point. Yeah, the good Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> the one that plays well, yeah. Uh, our rugby coverage is thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Um, let's talk about the squad. Like who, so, the, 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 um, I think we probably have a fair idea about the forwards. There's a bit of doubt about the back row, whether or not Tyke Byrne goes. It looks like John Klein is going at the moment. Um, and then it comes down to one of three, probably Jordy Murphy is, is on the bubble, Ty Burns on the bubble, and Reese Ruddock's on the bubble, and that'll be decided in the next couple of weeks. But I think Jordy Murphy goes all day. Do you, yeah? Yeah. Just because Joe Schmidt loves him. Well, and because he plays all three positions. So does Reese, though, really? No, not to the same degree as Jordy. Reese plays a bit of second row sometimes. Yeah, but they don't need second rows. They need another, they need a versatile back rower, and Jordy has never let him down. And um, I think. For me, if there's a, if if it's of that pick, Jordy ahead of Tyke Byrne as well. Yeah. Okay. So John Klein goes. Looks that way at the moment. You know, brings that bit of ballast that maybe we're lacking in in our other second rows. You know, we've got you know very kind of pliable um, workman like guys, but we we don't have guys that can smash rocks and carry hard and and are and are big and just it's nice to have a bit of that to to bring a different dimension to your game as well. Yeah. So understand if he was to bring him that would for me would be the rationale behind it so what is the halfbacks obviously we know that 9 and 10 18 forwards going yeah as he, as he 18 declared 14 that. no i don't think he's declared it but Eight, that's what it'll, this bit will be 18 four, i thought it was 31 no yeah so 18 13 18 13 good, yeah, no, no, good man no i was just wondering because yeah, i think there's going to going to be four halfbacks four centers and five back three that's you, how I you work. Say again? Do you think? I think we're going to bring two nines, two tens, four so, centers. So that's the big thing: the, whether they go two and two at half back, 
because if if they don't, uh, but the, I think the Carberry injury throws a spanner in that work. Yeah, because, most definitely. Because now, you know, I, I don't think they, I, do, I really don't think they want to bring another 10. I really don't. But now, you know, whether he's going to be fit to sit on the bench for the first game mm. is a make or breaker on, 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 you know, somebody else potentially getting into the squad. So I, I think there's definitely now only going to be two scrum halves and they might have their hand forced, you know, depending on his situation of having to bring a, a third ten. Yeah, I think they will, now that you say it. They have to, because the Scottish game is first. Yeah, the first so two, the, like, you know, it's, it's Scotland, Japan, the first two. What so. you can't be doing there is that you can't ask Joey to strap up his ankle and get through this game. When well, consider what, considering what happened Johnny in the Scotland game in the Six Nations as well, gone after 20 minutes, you know? So, like, I, I think... I think that's really changed things uh, in, in a short space of time. So as a result, I think for me, either Chris Farrell or Andrew Conway are going to miss out if they have to go with a, with a third ten. And he wants both of those, like cause I, I, yeah, <coughs> understandably. What, okay, if so you could have well, you're gonna have Henshaw, Bundyaki, Gary Ringrose, bankers. Uh, Stockdale, Earls and Rob Carney and Jordan Larm are four bankers, so that's mm -hmm. seven. And uh, Johnny, eight. Joey Carberry, nine. Two nines is 11. Marmion and... and um, McGrath. And, no, Marmion and Murray. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now, remember, the guys played there for the last eight years. <laughs> oh, <he's probably laughs> he, he has the benefit of playing wing too. <laughs> That's true too. Genuinely, genuinely, that might be. You know, that's that's gonna that's gonna help. Me. I remember against Australia, he did a great job, and he's and he came on against England in the Grand Slam game think last McGrath year. Too. Ahead of him, though. I don't. Okay. I don't. I do. I think. So. Yeah, you're gonna go. So two nines, three tens. That's five. Four centers. It's nine. I, and five and five so, four as back you said, yeah, I four. think it's a, it's four it's three and five or four it depends and four. what category you put Chris Farrell in well that's you the thing I, I, I think it's either him or Andrew Conway I, I think that he's going to miss out because Larmer can play 13 what would Chris you do Farrell is good. and, and Earls he can play 13 <laughs> Chris well, Farrell can play 11 and 14 can he yeah, yeah has he ever for Ireland though um, no whereas say, you could easily whereas on the wing. whereas <laughs> <laughs> whereas, oh, whereas Keith, uh, whereas uh, Keith Earls has um, played. has played a good bit of Test rugby at thirteen, Larmers, although it's not. This is about managing the squad over those number of games. Isn't would it? you put? Would you consider uh, Gary Ringrose a ten for a Test match? No. Okay. But he's. Do you know what? Is he a bit of nine cover as well? Played nine in school. Like, also <coughs> you have to get goal kickers on the plane. No one's talking about that, so you need to have Johnny, Joey, Conor Murray, Gary Ringrose as a kicker. Yeah, yeah but Conor, so Conor Murray, the fact that he can do it, is the third choice kicker. So that's where the pressure doesn't come with having to have another 10 on the plane, you know, if for yeah, some but, reason but you, you I only... think if you don't have another 10 to, it means you're, you know what I mean, you're getting uh, Johnny to tag out every game, which... It's not ideal. For, yeah, well, if you're thinking about I think winning they, it. I, I think they're going to have to, depending on if it's four to six weeks. If it's, say it's six weeks, best case or worst case scenario, and, and maybe that's not even worst case scenario, but six weeks, that definitely misses the first game. I think that's a huge risk to go with one ten, one known 10 in the Scotland game. Well, who's on the bench at that point? So then Conor Murray becomes your sub-10? Probably, and doesn't he? Or somebody else? Do that. But who else? Who are you going to put yeah. in? Sorry, there's a third ten definitely. Yeah. Oh, no. so, yeah. so, okay, well, if there isn't. Right. Yeah. So, so if, if there isn't. Who is that third ten? It's Ross Byrne versus Jack Carty. It, Jack Carty has the advantage because he's played. But that's what Joe's done well. He's We've got England, Wales, Wales, and he's announcing then, isn't he? He was so, announcing the between, the, the, Wales between the two Wales games. Yeah. So I think it's, it's absolutely odd to play for. I think literally it'll come 
Um, is anybody? I would I would say Ross is probably ahead in the fact that he is. I would think he has had more pressure moments, but that's only my. I would have said before the weekend that Jack was ahead because he was involved in Six Nations. That seems to count for more, right? For but Joe also, but now you know I wouldn't have thought that Jack had had a brilliant half an hour. You know, I know it's the first game of the season, but if we're really um, looking at pulling, pulling performances apart, I think it's very open again on, on the back of maybe and that his loose game, maybe Ross Byrne might be better in tune with being able to just facilitate other players around him rather than Jack. Because Jack's a, a great individual performer, but I, you, you know... know you make a great point, the fact that guys like that know too, Jar, that they need to be peaking now while the seasoned campaigners, the, the leaders know that they want to be... For the Scotland game? Yeah, or, or, or the latter stages of October. Right. You know what I mean? If you're ruthless in your thinking, while the guys that are on the periphery know, like, surely that... This is your World Cup this week. I've got to get this nailed to give myself this chance. And how do you convince? Uh, like, what, what, is it that 30-minute 30, that 30 cameo, you need to do something amazing? Or is it like, don't make a mistake? I think there'd be huge emphasis on, on what happens in training. I genuinely, yeah. like, I think we as supporters get really sidetracked by that. But like, you consider, okay, this was their public exam, which is their game. But for every public exam, there's five training sessions, which will be reviewed at the end of every day. And, and they are competitive and... Are they full contact training sessions? No, not at all, but so you don't need it. You, 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 you create an environment for competitors. It's just creating opportunity. You don't have to... It doesn't have to... Um, it doesn't have to be full bore for a coach to be able to identify whether someone really gets the system and is pulling the strings in the right way. So it's making the right pass at the right time, yeah. it's arriving in the right position. Being in the right place. Even when it's not full bore. Play. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you can't have full bore the whole time. You, <coughs> you never get, you get the game on a Saturday. Exactly. No, you've, you, the, you'll have almost non-contact for the week. And there are no hard luck stories. The good guys always emerge. They always stick out in training, especially over a sustained period of time. So, like, you know... I can remember watching a, a young Dennis Leamy and just kind of going, who's that guy, get him on the team. Keith Earl's the same. They, you, I, you have, you know, even in fairness to Owen O'Malley, when he came out once or twice, you could kind of see that this guy is. Mm. And, but it, it didn't happen in that case, but like all was in, in our time. Uh, the best players want to play with the best players and they want them involved. I need to take a quick break. Uh, stay with us. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone. Team of us, everyone in. Join Bruce Betting now for a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. That's right. New Irish accounts can enjoy a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. So if your first bet loses, we'll refund your stake with a free bet. Now that's giving you more. Bruce Betting. In store, online and now on your phone. T's and C's apply. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. Let's face it, the Irish summer has serious commitment issues. It's always late disappears for weeks at a time and consistently breaks its promises. But not us. At Electric Ireland, we're committed to giving you an 8.5% saving on your gas and electricity year after year after year after year. Visit electricireland.ie forward slash join for the kind of commitment you deserve. Estimated annual bill €1,736. Average consumption, urban 24-hour. Discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax. Residential, dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Terms and conditions apply. See electricireland.ie slash EAB. Rates at 1st of April 2019. Subject to change. All right, you're very welcome back. Uh, we've got Brian O'Driscoll and Ron Degar with us in the studio. We had a lot of questions in on uh, Instagram over the last uh, 24 hours or so. What do the lads think about on-field leadership during recent games? I feel it is lacking, says James Thompson, leading the audience here. Uh, I've been surprised by the lack of talking from the leaders when things haven't been going well. This is something we talked about when Sean O'Brien wasn't in the team, but how you'd miss that kind of uh, that voice. Are there many other people stepping up in his absence? Hard to know. Like, I, listen, we're we're watching the same thing, so I don't know what the small chat is like. You know, Rory Best has done a pretty good job over the course of the last two or three years since he's taken over. Um, I think he, you know, seems to he doesn't he he doesn't get flustered very easily. Um, deals with the referee very well. Um, but then, 
you know, when things aren't going right, we know that Johnny has that, you know, fiery part to his personality and, and his demeanour as well. We saw it a, a little bit in the Welsh game. Um, but, you know, you, you quickly forget all the brilliant moments that he's had over the last two years as well. So yeah. I, I, you know, it's difficult to, it's, when the momentum's against you, it's very difficult to shift it, and particularly when you're getting physically dominated. It's a simple game. When you beat the opposition side up, it's very hard for them to get into it, and that, that's what happened to us in the Six Nations. So all you can do is ask people to think about, about you know, the physical side of the game and, and try and get your momentum back that way. There's only so many words that you can say. Yeah, and, fair enough. It, you can't talk yourself into winning a I, fight. It's an individual thing as well. I think it's not just about... Plus, it's, it was the first pre-season game. No, but even I think the, even I they're going to talk Six about, about Six okay, Nations so. too. Um, the next one is actually, how can Ireland improve on an attacking plan that was so easily stopped by England and Wales from P. Gigsman on Instagram? Um, I don't know if the attacking plan was stopped so much as we lost the fight. In those games, how yeah, do you maybe not the fight, but you, if you lose collisions, rugby's very hard. We lost collisions. How do you go from say say we were to play that same England team again? How do you go from losing those collisions against the Vinopolas and Manitoulagi to suddenly winning those collisions? Yeah, well, I think in my opinion would be that yeah, you have a chance in the first two phases. If you don't win them on the first two phases, you're going backwards. But You've got to kick the ball then very accurately. But, as you know, your best kicking options are always when you have a run option and your best running options are always when you have a kicking option. But that's created basically by speed of ball. So, from that point of view, um, you know, I mean, it's easier when you're in the stand watching it, but you've got to just kind of identify who you want to put it on and who's going to chase it. I think teams, definitely in the Six Nations and England did, you know, there was such a focus on the power plays off set piece, you know, four or five phases of trying to set up the first three for that mm. for that strike run. And what happened was that England in particular put nobody into any rook in the first fourth phase. They just said don't go don't 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 be losing bodies in there, hopelessly going for ball. Just stack the field, two in the backfield, everyone else thirteen in the in the front field, and just defend that. And then they lose their shape and they lose their momentum. If they don't beat you in four, then we'll be fine. And they'll be forced to kick it and maybe kick it on our terms. And then there's an opportunity to counter-attack. So I think Ireland have had to evolve their game a little bit from that over the course. They've, Joe's had so much success with it, but I think teams have started to work that out for sure. And, and that's why their phase play has definitely gotten a lot more focus. And, and that's the, the chat that I'm hearing in, in training now right. as well. That's because uh, we've obviously been obsessed and I, I might have fallen into the trap again of like who's on the plane, but actually the most important thing that's happened, and we talked a bit about this during the week, is the new game plan and whatever that game plan is. So it's not a new game plan; it's just it's, it's a the, constant evolution. Of whatever what the evolution done. is, yeah. yeah. Installing what you're going to do at moments of when you have the ball, at moments of crisis, and then when you don't have the ball. But uh, you know, similarly, defenses are so strong these days that you, you know you look at the first 50 minutes of the game of what Joey did with his kicking game. You know, if it's, you can kick to regather, and that's such a huge focus of Ireland at the moment. You know, particularly, um, they didn't kick from nine at all, but you saw they didn't ever kick out of their 22 in a panic to try and get it off the field. Everything is kick contest, trying to use An Andrew Conway up in the air. They had a good bit of success. When it doesn't go right, which it didn't once or twice, it can be dangerous because the ball goes to the opposition and you're right back in your, you know, defending your own third. So you've got to get the accuracy of the actual kick right. But that's definitely a focal point for them that they think that they can get more than 50% of those contestables back. And as a result, they're going to be a scrap team and you win the scraps. You know, there's a huge not a positive knock-on effect to that. So that's the stuff that they're working on at the minute. Well, it looks like that. Listen, I don't, I don't know exactly what's going on in the training ground. I, I know that there's lockdown in over in Portugal at the moment. No one's allowed to watch um, training sessions. Everyone's been cleared out of the out of the campus uh, down in Kids of Lago. Um, so um, it's just from what I saw in the Italian game that that definitely feels as though it's a, a focus of theirs. It was something that we used to do in Leinster a good bit. It's that. It's that half and half kick. It's a it's a long garyon. That's what it is. It's a it's kind of a forty meter kick. So it, it gets you out of the real danger territory, but.
but not not relieving pressure, but giving you an opportunity to isolate a defender if you can't get a contest, um, or you know get up in the air and and try and pick up the scraps. I guess the question was like, how do we answer what happened to us in the Six Nations? What is the next evolution as a coach? What would you be thinking if you were in the Ireland setup at the moment? Okay, in the Six Nations, we got found out a little bit. Um, what do we need to do to make sure that if that happens the next time our players look up and go, okay, that's what you're doing? Yeah, good question. I think, um, as Brian said, I think because the team have had so much success out of Joe's game plans that they put such an emphasis on backing that plan, when that doesn't happen, the off chance, one in ten games, or the England game, or the Wales game, uh, is there a capacity for for people to see space without the prep work? Are we playing what we see in front of us or is it there is such massive trust in what they've prepped during the week that usually comes off? That would be the only question I'd have in my head and it's something that really interests me in the fact that um, how are you setting up or how is the team set up during the week to go after the opposition with the ball and how much is actually uh, put on pulling trigger live as opposed to playing rehearsed moves. That's something that I find really, really interesting because at times in a game you could see that there's, there is space but you'll still play the one to two, three on the short line and Johnny out the back where sometimes... What's the override? The yeah. hands might yeah. just do it. Mm. Uh, and that would be the only area I'd love to know more about from, from my point of view. Is that because they have repped it all week or because they have such faith in that move or are they actually seeing where and that's the, the responsibility is. of the eyes out wide you know they're the ones that see the space best so wingers centers fullbacks they have to be the ones the communicators back into 10 because 10 is so much on their plate and johnny's got brilliant vision but he can't see everything and if you shout to override it you know it means there's going to be space because these guys are programmed to do, to play to the game plan. Yeah. But you have to have a flexibility to still be able to head play and play heads up rugby. So you guys in Leinster had heads up rugby with Joe Schmidt, right? And you had the flexibility to override the game plan. Yeah, but it's easier at provincial well, level, isn't well, you were, it? You I'm, I'm because so you had him at thirteen, right? So Joe, uh, sorry, Joe, if that's the rock, okay, you're Connor and I'm Johnny, right? Your eyes are there, my eyes are here. Okay, and to here, and he I can go to here. <clears throat> but to be able to go there, there and there is really, really, really difficult. But if you know that he is two channels wider and his eyes are looking at here and backfield space, then I don't have to look up, I can just trust the call. If you understand me, because yeah. so if they run into a rock that way, you have to be in there because you have to concentrate on your skill, execution to get it to me, I'm your 10. I can see he, this defender, this defender outside him, this, these stragglers here, but he's 12 and 13 are, and when you got to play with someone like Dougie Howlett as a right winger, it was fascinating, his capacity inside to see space in the backfield, but then that's why Leinster were, were so good because they had a, a 13 that was, uh, you know what I mean, taking the skill side out of it, but someone who's able to see two seconds ahead so, notwithstanding the fact that um, you were playing at 13 and that it's easier at the interprovincial level, Joe Schmidt allowed the change. Because the, 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 the good point was that um, is it so pre programmed they have to stick to it? Is it that they can't see it or is it just that it wasn't working for them? The, I think it doesn't look like in Schmidt's career that he's been scared to allow his players to make decisions and play the no, game. So, and, and but also, that was the criticism of the team at the time. But also, from a player perspective, there's nothing more frustrating. I couldn't imagine any player, and certainly not Gary Ringrose and or Chris Farrell, that you know, that are the likely 13s to to go. Well, you know, the looks as though there's a bit of space out here, but you know what? I'm keep we called something. Yeah. yeah. So the, that's that's innately part of you as a player, where you identify an opportunity for you to get a go at something. You go, oh, I'll pass this one up. I, I'll get one in a few minutes' time. It's like there's a chance. Here here and a proper chance because there's space because I can see someone looking in or someone's pushed back in the backfield protecting you know a kick that's it for me 
and we have a chance to override it. And you just have to back your convictions as well. I think that's a huge part. You won't get everyone right, but you'll get more right than you'll get wrong. And well, you know, Smith, and that you, now then. Is that that's the, so like? Yeah. Well, I think that's this, we're getting into the nitty gritty now. This is what's really interesting. Then, I think for how you build trust among players is back in your game plan. So you've discussed it all week, so the leaders discuss it Monday morning, you present it on Monday evening, and this is why we're going to break these guys down. And then you have to have massive conviction in that. But what we are saying here, I think, is good becomes great when you stick to that, but you also have the capacity to pull trigger when you see something. It's not going off and trying to, as other coach said, pull a rabbit out of a hat or going away on your own. Because you don't, you don't have to win the World Cup, but you could lose it. You know, and I think there's a there's a, a lot in that statement and the fact that uh, going away and try to uh, do something on your own isn't buying into what you agree to and isn't being a team player. But what is a team player is back in your game plan, but also back in your instinct. And presumably they talk about that and they train for that too. Like, if, if you've got Kyrie Ringrose in your team or whoever it is at 13... I don't know, George. I genuinely I, I, don't know. I don't know the individuals well enough and, and we're not privy to what the chat is like. But um, Joe Schmidt would have done it with you guys, right? This is our game plan, lads, but when you see something, go for it. No or yes? Um, yeah, but I think he leaves that up to the comfort of the, of the player, you know? I think... Was that when uh, you were playing? But is it the same now? That's a, Do you know what? I, I never... For me, I never had to question whether he thought it was okay or not because it was, I called it because I felt there was space. Yeah. So I felt you were very I felt established as, by the I felt, time Josh But I came. felt as though I was right when I looked for it because there was space. I didn't call it because I thought I cre could create something and break from what everyone else was doing. I actually called it because, do you know what, there's an opportunity to, a better opportunity here than what we're running into there. Yeah, and that, that better opportunity is actually within the framework of the game plan. It's not like you're trying to beat four players on your own in a telephone box and deciding, right, I'm going to try and be hero heroic here. It's like, uh, there's a better opportunity yeah, here. And, and when it's we not get just there, about you. We go back I, to our game. You plan. know, when I, when I say, talk about the space, I go, there's space here, but it's, uh, I realise that there's two defenders. There's, do you know what? There's three on one and a half. So the wingers dropped out. I, you know, if I get the ball, I can get that other th defender in front of me and therefore creating a two on one. It's not about yourself. It's just about a better op opportunity than the one that you think the team is going through. Yeah. And so, do we think that the team are allowed to make those decisions? And make I, that I think call? any team is. I think, yeah, I think no, that's why you're. They are. That's why you're, you're an international player because you're of that caliber to and be able to make right good decisions. Thing. If they don't, it'll be a regret of theirs. You know, because there's obviously, you mean satisfaction, but real competitors need to have internal satisfaction as well and making sure that they. I've got the most out of it from a personal point of view. Otherwise, I don't think they'll be telling you the truth. Yeah, you know, so everyone wants to be performing to the best of their ability and show their best on the big days. A couple of quick ones here to, to wrap this up. Uh, do the lads think Simon Zebo should have been brought back in to play full back? Or brought back into the squad anyway? Um, yeah, it's... it's it, it's a difficult one. Uh, Talent-wise, I, I think most definitely. Uh, I think he has a capacity on his own to, to make a difference in big games. Um, but, um, you know, I think in terms of what the rules were um, and buying into the kind of team and loyalty, I think he made his decision with that. But from a rugby point of view, um, I think he most definitely has the capacity to play for Ireland, but I also would agree that how do you create a really strong domestic team without the rules that the IRFU have created? Could you have like a special last minute, oh, we've changed our mind for one quick week here. But what message does that send <coughs> to people at home then? I don't know. I mean, it sends the message that, like, Listen, we'll, under cer special circumstances, we'll change the rules. Zeebs has been excellent for Ireland. He's obviously been brilliant for Munster and done great, wor you know, great work over in um, in Rasting as well since he's gone over there. So of course he's got the X factor that other players don't have. 
Um, I, I got the f sense from early on that he wasn't a Joe Schmidt type player. He's very different from a winger perspective. You look at the wingers that are currently playing on the periphery. Okay, Jacob Stockdale, you know, it was a nice bit of X Factor. Keith Worlds, Earls is playing the best rugby ever. But I think if you look at Andrew Conway and Dave, Dave Carney, and Dave Carney you went with in the last World Cup as well, very different type of winner, wingers, very solid, very good under the high ball. I'm not saying Zebo isn't great work, work rate. I don't know how brilliant um, Simon B Zebo's work rate is. And, um, and I think he just, he never really, himself and Joe never, never really knitted brilliantly. And I think once he signed for Racing, I think, you know, he wrote himself out of any future selection with Ireland. Yeah, there was definitely a view that he saw the writing on the wall with Schmidt and that, that's why he signed for a team abroad as well. That because the character didn't, didn't they seemed to be a, a character clash and he decided, well, screw this, I'm going to go and take the money in, in I France. don't know, did he? I'd say, like, it's, you get one shot playing for your country, it's a massive decision. And I'd, I know he's hurting and I know it doesn't sit well with him, but it's not a good situation for anyone, I don't think. I, you know, I, I think, you know, when you say those wingers there, I think um, Z, a tuned in Zebo would offer more. I agree. You know, yeah. and it's a pity that a amicable solution wasn't found. And uh, uh, Zeebs had to cop himself on a bit, and potentially the Irish management, if they could have a, a sit down and get it right, because we don't have players like that too often and there'll be other people that disagree with me saying his work rate isn't anywhere near it but I'm I'm convinced that you can get that right if you have the person right. Can and I Brian's just point ask is it, pertinent I think that there was a clash of personalities. Isn't isn't it also the case now that things have changed a little bit in the last couple of years to the point where the the team in Leinster and Munster and Connacht and Ulster have got organised and the quality of players coming through from the academies are so strong that we should actually be able to compete with a bunch of our players also leaving. So if that middle tier of players were allowed to go and play in France or England, that actually that next tier of players at the moment coming through the academies who aren't getting game time would all get game time in the provinces. And that we're probably at a point where we could have 10 or 15 players playing abroad and not worry that much about the fact that they're going abroad for a couple of years. That we could continue to pick players if they travelled abroad is, is basically the, 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 the domestic strength is so good. The talent coming through from the academies at the moment is so good that if we lost three or four players a year who went off to play abroad, we'd be grand. The, the provinces would all be grand, it'd actually be good. But is that not why we're so good? Because of the, the competitiveness of there? It's a bit like, I don't know, thinking of an, of an analogy. Um, well, so, like, oh, you don't, you know... If Jordy Murphy had gone to England instead of Ulster, what's the difference? I mean, obviously, Ulster get a little bit better. Because they keep complete control of him. So every single week, they have his... Uh, life Ger, as a potential Irish international is mapped the minute he goes on the ferry or on the plane that's gone it's over he's with the he's in the perils of the French system or an English system and control is gone so that's about what building strength and depth is and what, it's what building a squad is and it's about I suppose building values about being an Irish squad member and it being the most there is huge strength and depth compared to 10-15 years ago uh, because they have got the Irish model so well and it's the envy of the world even in, even uh, every, you know you look at the New Zealand system the Ireland system is stronger in, in that regard but I agree with the I think the you know the, the Simon Zebo one is is a is, is a tricky one because in his head Johnny left and Johnny got picked so he said why am I picked he has a lot of caps for Ireland it's a fair it's a fair question isn't it People say, what about, Ian? what about Ian Manigan, where there are struggles at number 10? Now, it's slightly different because Zebos really is playing with a top European club now as well and still playing very well. Yeah, it, it, like, you can understand both sides of the argument. Don't get me wrong. It's, there's no perfect fix for it. But without it being a written rule, you know, it was, it's, it's a spoken rule. You can't write it down because certainly you'd be able to sue for that. Yeah. Like, as work practices go, it's, it's yeah. not really yeah. kosher. So, but, but Simon knew, or did, or did he go thinking, ah, but I'll be, I'll be too good to not be able to pick, and maybe he backed himself that way, but 
um, the strength of the squad and, and the strength of the players that have come through are close enough to where he is, maybe not of his standard, but close enough to be able to keep that rule as powerful as it is to keep homegrown talent here. And I think too, um, Joe is very smart in the fact that for creating competition within his squad, he has certain measurements which you need to meet uh, that are required from an athletic point of view. And I don't think uh, Simon, when he was in the squad, was was top of the range for that. And Joe creates an environment where it's very uh, competitive and he wants world-class standards. Simon is a world-class player, but his, his uh, some of his preparation wouldn't have met world-class standards. So in that regard, he wasn't... Uh, knocking the door down in terms of doing himself favours to get um, top of the queue to have a look at me, Joe. So, uh, well, that's fair enough. There's that's strength and weaknesses to both arguments. I just, uh, from a small country point of view, with a with a World Cup, um, he should be in training camps mm. potentially, but. Just on, on Rajna, I remember our first ever um, team meeting with Ireland, Joe put up all our DEXA scan results, which is your body composition, you know, your muscle mass, your lean, uh, your fat content, um, lean tissue, and did it by position. So you had an opportunity, flashed it up. So it was a, it was a name and shame. And but it, what it did, I remember looking and looking at Luke Marshall and seeing him as the leanest, strongest, best physique, and I thought, right, there's the target. And you know, Simon would have been in that category as well, and he would have been as well. said he would have been down the bottom of that pile. And I think what, it just brings in another factor on selection. And I don't think it was ever something that he really tried to get after in a major way where he changed everything in his life to get to the top of that list. And I think that brings in an attitude thing as far as a coach is, yeah. is uh, concerned. Yeah, it's another data point that they use uh, to make tight decisions. Last point, Brian, you've got to go. So um, are you feeling confident about Ireland's chances at the minute? Or what's the... Because like, it's all good instinct at this point, really, when we don't see what's going on in those training sessions. I'm and what not lacking confidence. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, with the with our better team out, I think you know we'll get some wins in the. Uh, certainly, I would I would hope at least one win. You'd you'd hope two out of the next three, but it might only be one. Um, but that's not the end of the world either. It's about getting game time, about keeping guys fit for uh, for the Scotland game, not losing any more bodies. Yeah. Uh, that's the that's the real focus. Trying to get them into the form that they because need to be they're. Do you know what they're getting? They're getting such a tough run of it at training. You know, I, I'm not I'm not so worried about actually what we get to see. To, to Roger's point, they're doing so much brilliant work at training that th they'll be happy enough if they if they can keep that injured list down. Uh, what, what's your confidence level at the minute? Oh, I it would be. Um, I just find it so exciting, you know what I mean? It would absolutely be brilliant to, to get a, to actually uh, spend a bit of time in the camp or spend, get in there. I just think it's never been so open in the history of a World Cup and the build-up. I think there's everything to play for. I genuinely um, believe that. I think um, it's um, just such an opportunity. It would be so good to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On that note, if uh, you need some more World Cup nostalgia in your life, check out the sit-down chat that Brian has recorded with uh, Dennis Hickey. You can watch it now on offtheball.com or youtube.com forward slash offtheball. Yeah, it was good, good old chat. Was it all about 07? Or was there some? Yeah. yeah. No, 03. 03. 03, yeah. 03, yeah. That was the good one. Where yeah, we left 07, 08. 99 and 03 is what we talked about. 03 was the good one. Yeah. A bottle of whiskey at the end of it. <laughs> Depressing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we'll uh, we'll see you again real soon. Rugby on off the ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. OTB Sports Radio with BruceBetting.com.